I will say this, push your colors a little bit more. Try to experiment with just pushing. Go, go where you haven't gone before with your colors. Cause you can always gotta know that there's about four or five components of light and shadow. I'm not sure if you And don't use whites to make your greens lighter instead. Hey, Plain Air Painters, how's it going this week? Terry with Learning Plain Air here. And uh, this week we're going to give you three or four of my very best tips and advice for painting trees. And I really think this is gonna help you improve your tree painting skills. It really doesn't matter what kind of trees you're painting. Painting uh, maple trees, palm trees, evergreen trees, bonsai trees, deciduous trees, coniferous trees, carnivorous trees, any kind of tree. This advice, these principles are really gonna help you improve your tree painting skills impressionistically and painting on plein air. I don't really know my trees, you got me, but I think I know how to paint my trees. So let's find out if I do. Make sure too you stay tuned to the very end. I'm gonna give you a power tip. I'll give you a hand. It has to do with color. If you're having trouble with muddy colors or getting your colors to pop, You'll want to stay tuned for this power tip. It will be powerful, I promise. All right. We're in a beautiful place uh, about 40 minutes from my house called Placerville, Colorado in the southwest mountains of Colorado. And I'm down on the river here. I was going to paint on the river. As you can see, it's not quite frozen over. I'm pretty daring and adventurous, but uh, I think today I'm just going to pop up above the river. There are some nice trees and tree shadows along this river. It's mostly frozen. I could probably find a good spot, but I think I'm gonna pop up on the banks of the river and catch another place today. 20 yards or so from the river. Millie's here with me today. And uh, of course, I am gonna show you, she can plant her paint, I've trained her. Anyway, let's look at our setup here. We've got the sled that came in handy today. Uh, I paint mostly these days on a chair if I can. I've got a bad back from the old hockey playing days. And let's go ahead and just uh, take a look at our setup here. So I've got a French box, Julian Easel some palettes with some oil paint. I've got my palette and my plein air set up facing into the sun so that my paints can be in shadow. You always want to do that when you're painting on plein air. But let's take a quick round of my paints. I hope you can see them. I've got uh, titanium white, yellow ochre. We've got permanent rose, alizarin crimson, cad red, cad orange, cad yellow medium, cad yellow light. We've got phthalo green, uh, cerulean blue, cobalt blue, ultramarine blue, and phthalo blue. I've got a lot of colors on my palette, but that's how I was trained. I like to have that variety. You can always paint with less. It's less expensive too. I always paint with uh, artist grade or more expensive paints and, and a little bit better pigments, but I encourage all beginners to paint with cheaper oil paints and use lots of paint and experiment and not let cost get in the way of, of painting. I've got a uh, 12 by 16 on plein air painting board. I might flip that around and make it 16 by 12 because we're painting that tree right there. So I'm probably gonna change that. I've got my backpack with various things in it that I might need for a plein air painting trip. See my video on plein air setup in the description and you'll get a, a more in-depth view from studio to the field and back on how I do my plein air setup and everything you need to get going as a beginner plein air painter. The link is in the description. It's a free private unlisted video that you can't get unless you put in your email and join our community, which we would welcome you. My brushes, uh, I use a variety of brushes. In the beginning again, I would experiment with cheaper brushes and then once you get better or have more money, you can start paying more for your brushes. But I use a number 12 filbert mostly, carry a couple of those in here. Number eight and number six, some smaller filberts. And today we'll probably use this Robert Simmons signet brush, I would imagine with trees. I'm almost certain that I will. It's got some real thick, nice big bristles on it. Excellent for trees. I've got extra titanium white, use a lot of white and uh, I use a cheaper oil painting brand mostly, Georgian. Sometimes I use Gamblin and others. My, my oil paints are Gamblin, but uh, I also been trying this Winsor & Newton liquid impasto. I like this stuff. You mix it in with your paint in the uh, mid to latter stages of your painting and it helps give you that buttery impasto look. The, my, my one complaint about this stuff is if you put too much out on your palette and you try to save it for the next time, it's unusable. I don't like that at all about that, about that stuff. One last thing, I've got affiliate links uh, below in the description to dickblick.com. That's where I order all my art materials. You can click on there at no extra cost to you and browse their inventory. Great prices, the best customer service, by far the best online way to order art materials. Okay, so here's a scene that I chose for our painting tutorial for how to on plein air paint trees. Some nice tree shadows in there. It's a beautiful tree. So I'm gonna take you step by step on how I'm gonna paint that tree. And I really, really believe this is gonna help you no matter what your painting style, and no matter what kind of tree you're painting. All right, let's get going. Well, again, if you're new with us, welcome. And uh, the first stage of my painting process on plein air is called the drawing stage. And it's where I put on a wash, 
and then I draw with a brush. And I want to go over the four P's of my drawing stage with you if you're new. It's going to really help you. But my wash, I'm just going to put on a pure CAD yellow wash today. The reason I put on a wash is to cover up the white canvas so that I can read my lighter values in particular more accurately. You know, I don't know, some, some painters are okay with having a, a white canvas, but I really like to cover up the canvas, get a neutral tone on there so that I can read my colors better. And you can just use turpenoid very lightly and put it in there and uh, just cover it all up. You can use whatever color you want. Today I'm just using a bright yellow wash to kind of complement with the, uh, the beautiful cools in the landscape today. And here's my four P's if you're new. Pieces, placement, proportion, and perspective. So I want to divide the complex landscape up into pieces. And since we're painting trees today, the tree is going to be one of those pieces, the main piece. Placement, I want to make sure that in my landscape painting, the tree and everything else is placed within its proper boundary. Everything has a boundary where it goes on the painting, so keep it there. Uh, pieces placement proportion, I want to make sure that everything is proportionately sized the way it's supposed to be, accurately depicting the scene I'm painting. So the tree has to be the right size. You can take some artistic liberties, of course, but, uh, and then perspective. Uh, you want to be able to try to show perspective in your painting if you can. And if you have barn lines or road lines, today we have a little bit of a, a tire tracks in the snow there. Uh, and so I can use those to show perspective in my painting. And then what we do is we draw with a brush and I'm gonna show you real quick how we do that. I'm gonna put it in time lapse and then we'll come back and talk about it real quick. Here we go. All right, we finished the drawing, and as you can see, I flipped my canvas back to a 16 by 12, a more higher uh, format so I can fit that tree in and just focus on the tree and make it a little bit more intimate painting. And in doing so, I have split my pieces into three different pieces in the landscape. So when you're painting trees, your trees are just a piece of the landscape. And so piece number one is going to be these two or three trees to my left right here in the foreground, immediate foreground that I'm focusing on right here. Piece number two, there's some, some mountains, some foothills, rocks out there in the distance. That'll be a big piece. that will serve as my background piece. And then piece number three will be all of this foreground snow right here and the shadows in it. Okay, and the other thing you want to do in the drawing stage, in addition to your pieces, is you want to signify where your darkest dark is going to be. For me, it's going to be the, these tree trunks and these trees right here to the left. So I just kind of briefly suggested how dark those were with a darker paint. And then also uh, these kind of tracks in the snow. This little trail right here going back will have some some part of the darkest darks in it and then shadows okay so there's shadows here in the trees that we want to show shadows coming across the snow trail here that we want to show and that will do it for your drawing stage and then it's on to the next stage of tree painting which is the abstract stage okay so here we go and hey if you're new to this channel would you consider subscribing right now because you don't want to miss out on these uh on plein air high mountain adventures we have every week it's going to help you be a better painter gonna help you uh, de-stress and, and get more joy in your life and make beautiful paintings. Okay, let's just show you what I've mixed up real quick here to get going. I've mixed up a few tree colors, kind of a shadow, darker tree color here using ultramarine blue and, and cad yellow medium right here and kind of a little more reddish mixture using some alizarin crimson over here with some ultramarine blue and phthalo blue in here for a cooler kind of tree trunk color and I'll dip into some probably some uh, cerulean blue and put that and that mixture as well. It's a very, very cool blue color. If you can see that, I know we're in shadow. So that makes a very cool purple color right there. And then I've got some lighter colors mixed up with the trees, the same I use to mix my yellows. You can do it a lot of different ways, but your greens, I mean, a lot of different ways. I used ultramarine blue, cad yellow medium, and a hint of cad red to just kind of gray it down a little bit in that mixture. And then some snow colors here for the back distant uh, foothills, just to kind of get those in a little bit later probably, and using some ultramarine blue and, and some reds in this corner of the palette right here. Okay, so let's get going. Okay, I'm just gonna get a few darkest darks in here, starting with the tree trunks of these beautiful, magnificent pines. We've got our, we've got our Griswold family tree picked out. I like it, except we're not gonna cut it down and put it in our living room. And shove it through our window like he did we're gonna paint it that'll be more fun oh that was pretty funny and then let's get into tip number one here when you're painting trees on plein air and here we go you want to take your trees through three or four steps to get them to look like 
impressionistic plein air trees. I've already given you some hints. You want to draw it out first, then you want to abstractly block it in, then you want to form it, and then you want to finish it. And so these are also kind of some of my stages that I teach in my uh, plein air painting process. And so beginning, you just want to, you just want to draw it out. And then secondly, you want to spend 80% of your tree painting time in what I call the abstract stage, where you're just trying to block in two dimensional shapes, just flat shapes with the right color, the right value and the right temperature. So that's what you're doing first. I'm using a big Robert Simmons uh, brush to block these trees in. And I'm just going with the shadow portion of these first using those mixtures that I that I told you about. Oh, but like I said, 80% is gonna be in the abstract stage, just trying to find the right color, the right value and the right temperature and block it in in the right piece. And then you wanna form it. About 10% of your painting should be forming it. And I'll talk more about that. And about 5% should be your finish. And I'll tell you exactly the two or three things that you wanna to do to finish your painting when you're painting trees. So we'll go through it step by step, but let's just, let's just chill out, relax a little bit and uh, enjoy some painting as we go here. Beautiful day, sunny day. It's about 23 degrees, I think, a little chilly, but the sun kind of makes up for it here in Southwest Colorado. Let's just get our, let's just get a snow color in there. I've got a mixture of cerulean blue and some permanent rose just to get a nice bright snow color. We got the shadow blocked in in our tree and then we'll do the light portion of the tree next. Dip into a little alizarin crimson into that tree trunk color and just kind of want to make sure as I go along and that gets covered up now and again that I go back and keep that in there because it's part of my darkest dark and it's going to help me show space and depth in my painting. All right, so in the abstract stage, we're basically just blocking in two dimensional shapes with no detail. Don't get any detail. Hold back. Tell your brain not to get detail oriented. Keep it loose. Keep it impressionistic. Just work on getting your values and nailing your colors early on and really try to hold back from, from describing something in too much depth and too much detail. It's hard to do as painters, I know. You can see how impressionistic that is. My painting's not gonna look like much if you're new here. It won't look like much until we get to the end. And I do that on purpose, that's kind of my style. So I was trained in Russian impressionism and. That's just how we do it. But if you're a realist, these principles will apply to you too. You wanna to compare constantly one tree to another, one color to another, like colors to, to another, greens to greens, blues to blues, and then adjust them and ask yourself, in previous videos I've taught, ask yourself, should I make it lighter or darker, warmer or cooler? And then make your adjustments as you go, constantly comparing. Okay, let's just go ahead and briefly get the sky in there just real quickly i think it'll help me read all the other colors i'm just using a, a big number 12 brush and just going to use a mixture of cerulean blue it's a really a bluebird day out here in colorado today so the sky is is very blue but it's always going to have a hint of purple so i added a bit of cadmium red and some titanium white Sorry, the old easel's shaking and baking today. A lot of years on this old puppy. I think it's probably 15 years old, this easel. It's French box Julian easel. Let's get back to it. In the forming stage, what you wanna do then is you want to start to look at the different planes within the pieces and describe the form in more detail. You pay attention to the subtle shifts in color, the subtle shifts in, in value and temperature of things. All right, so you want to make them become more like three-dimensional shapes and you want to model them. You might hear that, that, that word modeling out there as well. So that's kind of what you're doing in that state. And then thirdly, in the finishing stage, there are three components to the finish of any painting really, but especially with trees, you want to focus on your darkest dark. You want to make sure you have your lightest light because that'll help things pop and contrast. And then you want to finish off with any accents, you know, perhaps a, a flashy, brilliant brushstroke that you decide to add to the painting, wherever it may be. All right, so your darkest dark, lightest light, and your accents. So that's tip number one. And there's some shadow right there beneath the tree that we want to describe. It's kind of a very bright purple color. So let's go with a color like that right there. We'll describe that shadow 
a little more as we get into things. Really haven't left my, my Robert Simmons number 12 brush, just kind of sticking with it and using it. And as you see stuff happen, try to grab it. Like for example, I just see a nice contrast between two pieces. The piece right here in the background of that cliff and mountain, and then the, the sun shining on piece number one, the distant part of piece number one, the snow, because it's real nice. It's a nice thick paint. Just back in there. You know, I was talking to you in the opening about my chair. Um, I don't know how many of you, if you have, a, if you have a, a bad back, throw it in the comments and let me know. But I've, I've had chronic back pain for over 20 years now. Um, I heard it originally playing uh, professional hockey, weight training and playing professional hockey. And that's kind of really how I, I heard it. I've got degenerative disc disease on my lower back and it's kind of humiliating. I, if, if you have it, you kind of know where I'm coming from here. It, it just, it prevents you from doing a lot of things you'd want to do, you know? I mean, as an ex-pro athlete, you kind of think that forever you can kind of just do whatever you want to do and lift whatever you want to lift. and but it, uh, it's humbling because I got to ask my younger daughters and my wife sometimes to help me lift stuff and schlep my painting stuff to, to shows and stuff in the past. And it's not easy, but I don't let it stop me from doing what God put me here to do and what I love and what I'm passionate about, and that's plein air painting. But, uh, we all have our little challenges. We all have our little thorns on our sides, and just wanted to kind of share that with you, and that's why I, I paint on a stool, just to kind of take it a little bit easier on my back. Let's go on to uh, tip number two, and that has to do with the components of light and shadow. You got to know that there's about four or five components of light and shadow, and I'm going to share a few of them with you right now as we paint trees. If you want to paint good trees, understand that uh, there are these components to a tree. There's light, shadow, cast shadow, there's a core dark in the painting, there's a half tone in the trees, and there's a highlight in the trees, and I'll describe each of those as we go. Okay, right now I'm working on the light component of the tree, just with some quick impressionistic strokes. Just where the, the light is hitting the tree. And you know, you can use different strokes as you saw there. I'll just use, I'll use various strokes, like a thick stroke like that. I'll sometimes have the brush like this and just do little strokes like that that show kind of the rounded needles. It's an evergreen tree. You can also take your brush, if you want to talk about strokes and brush strokes with trees and to de describe it a little bit more accurately is I could start here with one and then I could kind of do some rounded strokes like this to describe the roundness of the needles on the tree. And that's especially effective when there's snow on the trees. Right now there's not, but you can kind of describe the snow with brush strokes like that. It's kind of nice and then a little more daring things to do like this when you get a little more experience and you're not afraid is you can kind of take your brush and go like that and just blend. You want to show some hard lines, some soft lines. Um, I know that takes a little bit of experience to kind of do that. You might be scared to mess up your painting to do something like that. That takes a little bit of practice. So let's talk a little bit more now about those components of light and shadow. There are different things you need to pay attention to. So let's talk about the half tone. All right, the half tone is the actual color of the tree when it's not being washed out by the sun directly shining on it. And it's not the color of the shadow. It's, if you think of the tree as any kind of three-dimensional shape, it's gonna have the dark side, it's gonna have the half tone side, and it's gonna have the light side. The sun is coming from here, from right to left. So this part of the tree is gonna be washed out, you know? But in the middle part of the tree, I wanna make sure I leave some brush strokes for the actual color and value of the tree that isn't being washed out by the sun. That's really called, that's really called the half tone. And it's the kind of the green, evergreen color that you think of, you know, or at least that I'm seeing here in the tree. So I want that, I want brush strokes to include that color in there so that I more accurately describe the tree and it's not just too colored, light and dark, you know yellow and, and, and blue dark. So I can kind of bring that color into the light like that so that it looks a little more realistic. Depending on where you live and what kind of tree you're painting, they're gonna be different greens, but always look for that complementary color in the shadows, okay? So I'm dipping into alizarin crimson, just pure alizarin crimson, gonna put it in my mixture. And the impressionists were the first to figure out that there's always the opposing 
and complementary color in the shadows, and that would be a red color. So don't be afraid to dip into your cad red or your magenta or your alizarin crimson, whatever you use, and just kind of throw that, just hints of that color in there to describe it. That's too brilliant and too bright um, right there. But here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna go back into my dark color. I'm gonna put some phthalo blue in with some alizarin crimson. And I'm gonna cover it up, but not completely. I'm just gonna leave it. I'm gonna leave it showing through because your eye can make more sense of it. Okay, let's keep going with our pieces here. Let's describe these other trees. Let's look at this oak tree in the distance. I've got some alizarin crimson. I'm gonna put some cerulean blue in. It's not quite as dark in value as these other trees. So I wanna be careful not to make it too dark. I think it could go a little darker. I'm gonna creep up on it. A little more permanent rose in there. A little more orange to gray it down. But a little darker value. That's pretty close. I can go darker still. So I'm gonna go into ultramarine blue. And just put it in that pile. It's kind of a gray purple mixture. There's a nice tree right there. Let's just let that happen. You know, another thing you can do with trees is use your palette knife. I would highly recommend you practice with a palette knife and use it because you can do some beautiful, some beautiful effects with trees with a palette knife. And it takes a lot of practice, I think, but try it. It's fun. So I did a side stroke there for the tree trunk, just like that. And then for these, these tree branches coming off. See, that helps me show depth and space because these are this tree's darker than the sky. But when you're doing trees, don't forget about your palette knife, man. It's a nice little tool to have. You probably can't see that. Let me go from this, this angle here. Down. Do some, some branches that are gonna come down as well. Let me show you how easily you can just make a tree, okay? You don't have to overcomplicate it. We're talking about light and shadow right now, but uh, I can do a tree in... in four or five strokes if you're talking about impressionism. So you can just go like this, watch. Voila, tree. Try sometimes to use what they call economy of brushstrokes. Try to describe things in as few of brushstrokes as you can. It sometimes give it a different look to your painting, a little more authentic, a little more impressionistic perhaps. Dipping into some red to kind of put here in the, on the shadow side of the tree. You can come across like this and you can kind of scoop and do a little, do a little side scoop stroke. You can do a downward stroke. Let's talk about the highlight. And so on these trees here, there's a really strong highlight. The sun shining directly and brilliantly into the trees. So I'm gonna go into titanium white, cad yellow, cad orange. Cad yellow light, a really expensive, cool green color. <laughs> Dip into some of my medium. Okay, I get a big old scoop of paint on there. And let's try to describe the light part of the tree. The light's coming in there. I see a little more green in there. So I'm gonna add a little ultramarine blue or some, some phthalo green might do it. The sun on the trees. It's just direct wash out color that comes in on the tree directly from being in the sun. So again, working on the, the Griswold family Christmas tree here is, I don't want to lose that, that tree trunk either because that describes when I'm painting. So I want to keep that in there. In front of the trees, this is more of a detail finish move, but I'll show you right now real quick. There's some tree branches that can contrast nicely in the woods here coming out that you can kind of just briefly show the contrast and just show some some light and dark there in the trees all right so let's talk about the core dark so we talked about light shadow cast shadows half tone highlight and the core dark so these are all elements of light and shadow the core dark is the part of the tree where no light gets in and don't make it black so try not to muddy or blacken up your colors even though it might look like it. Search for colors that are actually actually there. I've been telling you to search for blues. I'm gonna dip in a cobalt blue. Another very expensive blue color. <laughs> and 
and show that core dark. It's the part of the part of the tree where no light gets in. And it will really help you describe your tree colors more accurately. And then what we can do, let's go back to the highlight part of the tree. Okay, I can dip into pure, I'm gonna dip into pure cad yellow. I'm gonna kind of put it in my green mixture. I'm gonna go cad yellow light. I'm gonna get a big old glob on the brush like that. And then save your strongest highlight colors for last. And just put hints of them on there to just show the brilliance of that highlight in the sun. And just use pure paint. Don't mix a medium with it. Just pure paint like that. Okay, and over here in our, our Big Daddy, I'm, we can do the same thing. I'm just seeing some more orange in there, so I'm gonna include that color. In the highlights. If it's too brilliant and too strong, I can cover it up, but I will say this, push your colors a little bit more. Try to experiment with just pushing. Go, go where you haven't gone before with your colors because you can always dial them back. I can cover that up in a heartbeat. But what if I loved it? What if it added to my painting? What if uh, it made you a better painter and made people say, wow, look at your colors. I love your colors. Don't be afraid to be bold. Be adventurous, courageous. Do something different. Paint with emotion. Paint with passion. Paint what you see. Paint what drew you to the scenery. I'm going to go back into that and I'm going to go and just put a little more cad yellow, medium and light. A little more bright highlight green color and put it on top of that and let's just see what we find. I'm gonna go quick. Try not to cover it all up, but leave that in there. Okay, I like that. Let's take our other brush. And another thing I can do as a, a tree technique, because if you're an impressionist, is kind of a back and forth stroke. So you can go like this, and then go like that with the other side of the brush. It's another just technique that you can try. See if you like that. A little bit of blending. Don't be afraid, just try it. I'm really forming right now and describing the tree a little bit more with the the changes in the planes and the gradients. That's kind of what I'm doing now. Let's go back to this tree. I'm gonna dip into some yellow ochre. A little bit of uh, titanium white. Cad yellow, or cad yellow light, cad yellow medium, whatever you wanna do. And then we'll just describe the light hitting those branches with some thick impressionistic strokes like that. Like that. Okay, and then back here, as the light changes in that shadow portion, there's a nice contrasting trees that are, are catching some light that I think will help describe this piece a little bit nicer. All right, before we move into tip number three here, let's kind of take a zoom in on the palette and see what we got going here. These were all my mixtures. I like to put my colors beside each other. The tree colors here, the snow colors here, these, uh, highlights on the trees that we did right there. Push some colors aside because we're gonna get some, some new colors going here and just make a little bit more room. And, but I wanna keep those colors there so that they're kind of like my roadmap, you know? So I don't wanna get rid of them, but I'm gonna make a little bit more room. Let's kind of show you some color mixing here. The snow is getting a lot more contrast in it with, with light and shadow. So I'm gonna put a pile there and dip into some, a little bit of cad yellow medium right there for a highlight snow color. Maybe even a little bit of cad yellow light, a really cool kind of bright yellow color. And then I was seeing the snow, you know, kind of a violet. It's got red in it, you know, so I'm gonna go into some, some permanent rose and then a little cobalt blue right there. But that's pretty close right there. For kind of what I was seeing, I'm gonna add a little, a little titanium white. Shoot, I'll scoop a little bit of that light color in there, just to kind of get a warm, cool snow color. That's kind of a cool thing you can do. Take your your light and mix it into the cool, and you got a warm cool that can give you a neat color. I'm really seeing that color out there. And then lastly, the shadows. Put that, put a scoop of titanium white right there. 
So we've got three colors right beside each other. I'm gonna go into ultramarine blue. The shadows are really a blue violet color. In fact, I'm gonna leave mostly ultramarine blue in there and just a hint of a hint of cad red, not much. I really want it to be a violet, pretty strong blue color because that's what I'm seeing. I'm even gonna probably put a little bit more ultramarine blue in there and just make it stronger. Gonna go, like I said, air on the side of a little bit more power, a little bit more color, because I can always dial it back. So uh, let's get back up on the canvas and see what we can do. Here we go. With some tracks, I think we'll put that. That's kind of an artistic choice. Sometimes that can be neat, you know? And let's show our perspective. We talked about that in the opening. The tracks will be narrow here, and then to show perspective, they'll get a little wider. And the same with uh, same with this beautiful tree right there, and then that one. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna dial it down a bit. I'm gonna try to show a little perspective and depth because this is further. It's further away. Again, you're always looking with trees. You know, always look for ways to create some contrast in your in your painting. Like I see a tree branch sticking out on the Griswold tree right here. It's very bright. I'm just gonna try it. It might mess it up, but I'm just gonna try it. I don't really care. You know, it's coming out like this. Tell me what you think. Did you like that or did you not like that? <laughs> What's your opinion? You know how there's some dead tree branches and they catch light. I just think it's a better way to describe this tree. If you can just kind of pay attention to what's going on. And when you see that, don't be afraid to put it in. With thick paint on our Robert Simmons Signet brush, be careful you don't go over your shadow. Go in between the shadows like this. And then right here, take the side of your brush and just swoop it up into the snow like that and then swoop it down and just kind of go back and forth like that. And there's some sun coming across the path like that. So let's just quickly take our brush and go into the shadow just really quickly like that. Don't be afraid, just, just do it. Do it quick, just do it like that. And then go the other way like that and then like that. It's how you paint with passion and emotion and those kind of happy accidents make you look like a genius. People are like, oh wow, how'd you do that? Let's go on to tip number three. Tip number three, don't be a leaf counter. Okay, let me explain. You have to, if you're a beginner planner or painter, and this is all new to you, or you just started in the last few months or the last couple years, you have to change your mindset that you're painting a tree. You may have heard the term, pay what you see. Now, well, I was looking at my workshop notes that I took when I was a beginner painter uh, early on and I'm just working on some highlights here the highlight portion of the tree and making them even stronger as we go along but my notes said I made a realization I've been painting trees instead of shapes and pieces and that was a key realization for me in my plein air journey that I had been I had been focused on trying to make it look like a tree you know and when you're painting trees like this it's really crucial that you, uh, you really have to fight your mind because your brain wants to make sense of it and to detail it to death. But that will, that will not help you in your plein air efforts. That will hurt you. You wanna just be painting. You don't wanna count every leaf. You wanna just get the gesture of the tree. Remember how earlier I just described these trees with a few strokes? That's why I did that so you could see that you can really describe a tree just by doing a few different directional strokes and the mind's eye believes it. So you don't have to be a leaf counter. Try to get away from being a leaf counter. And I think your paintings will, will drastically improve. Uh, put that in the comments, you know, tell me what you think about that or what you've learned. Uh, other people need to hear about that. I think it's a key point. So go ahead and leave a comment there on that. By the way, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, uh, we're gonna be here every week for you, really uh, trying to help you become a stronger plein air painter. We talked about lost and found edges in our last snow video. And I'm gonna do that right here. I'm gonna get an edge going here with some distant snow. I'm gonna lose it and then I'm gonna find it. I'm gonna lose it and I'm gonna find it again. I'm gonna find it again. And that just kind of produces a nice little variety and interest back there. Okay, here we go. Let's take a look at some strokes thus far and see what we got cooking here. There's some snow strokes getting pretty thick toward the end. Tree strokes, light, shadow, cast shadow, core dark, 
Half tone. Well, hey, Terry with Learning Plain Air here signing off. Thanks for joining. Hey, give me a thumbs up if you liked any of those points in there. And, uh, of course, subscribe. We're going to have an awesome video next week as well. Hey, happy painting. God bless and take care. Okay, here's this week's power tip. And since many trees are green, we're going to talk about how to make your greens more vibrant in trees. Here's a, uh, a photo of a painting, two paintings, one from a beginner and the same painting from an advanced professional artist. Uh, the one on the right has definitely some advantages to the one on the left. So if you're a beginner planar painter, don't just rely on out of the tube greens to mix your greens. That's kind of what this artist did here. Very, very limited and very basic with the greens. And it looks like they just kind of used out of the tube greens a lot or didn't really mix greens properly and vibrantly. 50 to 100 ways to mix greens. And so I just want to encourage you to use various blues and view, use various yellows to mix your greens. So here we have ultramarine blue, we have a, a Windsor blue or like a thalo blue, a cerulean blue, the coolest of blues right here. And then we have black. So you can mix greens using black and yellow, blue and yellow. And so you can use uh, lemon yellow or cad yellow light. You can use cad yellow medium. Uh, you can use yellow ochre. So for example, a nice combination of black and yellow ochre produces this this beautiful kind of tint or tone that you can use in your tree colors. And so using various blues and using various yellows can help you produce versatility in your greens. And don't use whites to make your greens lighter. Instead, use your yellows to make your greens lighter. Um, if you wanted to do a real cool um, kind of vibrant green color, you could use cerulean blue and cad yellow light or cad yellow lemon, for example, if you wanted to use kind of a more uh, less powerful, vibrant green, you could mix ultramarine blue and yellow ochre to produce a bit more of a muted green color. Okay, so I hope that helps you.